Hello and welcome to Uzreport World News and my name is Bahram Gaffarov. International organizations are now expressing their full readiness to back up recently adopted special resolution of UN General Assembly on declaring the RLC region a zone of environmental innovations and technologies. This was part of the second international summit. Partnership for Green Growth and Global Goals 2030, held virtually on Sunday with the participation of Uzbek President Shavkat Mirzoyev. The two-day forum was organized in a bid to overcome the consequences of the climate change, the so-called green recovery, and ensuring carbon neutrality. President of Uzbekistan shared his vision of the prospects for international cooperation in the field of green recovery. Uzbekistan's commitment to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 under the Paris Agreement was reaffirmed. The widespread introduction of green technologies and the implementation of projects in the field of green energy would allow to increase the share of renewable energy sources by more than three times in the coming decade. Following the event, Uzbekistan expressed its readiness to become member of P4G partnership. Overcoming the global consequences of the RLC disaster was on the spotlight. It was proposed to continue active joint work in this direction within the framework of the specially created UN Trust Fund, the Global Green Growth Institute, on the platform of the P4G partnership and other international institutions. The number of total confirmed coronavirus cases in Uzbekistan has now exceeded 100,000, according to statistics of Health Ministry. Nearly 96,000 of patients have been able to overcome the disease, while 690 have died. Some 3,600 patients remain in medical institutions to undergo treatment in accordance with the standards. All new cases were identified among those who were in contact with patients. Most of the cases were revealed in the capital city of Tashkent. On April 1st, Uzbekistan established certain restrictions according to which citizens are required to wear masks when entering public transportation. Uzbekistan's Senate on Friday held another regular meeting that it reviewed and ratified the United Nations Convention on Rights of Persons with Disabilities, the first comprehensive human rights treaty of the 21st century adopted on December 13, 2006 in New York and entered into force on May 2, 2008. The Convention reaffirms that all persons with all types of disabilities must fully enjoy their human rights and fundamental freedoms. Besides, it identifies areas where adaptations have to be implemented for persons with disabilities to effectively exercise their rights in areas where their legitimate freedoms have been violated and where preservation of rights must be reinforced. The legislators highlighted that the ratification of treaty would help create additional guarantees for Uzbek citizens with disabilities and serve as a roadmap to further improve the country's legislation towards achieving a mutual goal. The document includes 50 articles developing to ensure that persons with disabilities enjoy full equality under the law. The senators added that now Uzbekistan has assumed international obligations to improve the relevant infrastructure for persons with disabilities in the Republic. The United States Agency for International Development, in partnership with the Minister of Energy and Water Resources of Tajikistan, has launched a new five-year, 39 million U.S. dollar regional energy program, the U.S. Embassy in Tajikistan said last week. The program will assist Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan in reaping economic benefits from cross-border energy trading, meet their national energy priorities and improve energy security via greater regional connectivity, the US aid added. Central Asia holds abundant renewable energy resources, including hydropower from melting glaciers and wind energy drawn from constant clash of mountain air with warm air from arid regions. USAID via the project aims to provide technical services to the region's governments, investors, energy companies and development organizations. It will also support national and regional energy market reforms, strengthen the regional electricity market and promote greater adoption of clean energy technologies. 105 hectares of the Andijan region of Uzbekistan is set to become an industrial hub for mechanical and electrical engineering in a span of 30 years. The creation of hub has been approved by the president Shavkat Mirzoyev. 
to attract investors and boost the localization process, special tax, customs and currency regimes would operate here. In the hub, it will be possible to get buildings for rent or land plots for permanent use to choose from. Creation process of free economic zone. Andijan Farm is another achievement of the region. The construction sector in Uzbekistan saw construction work amounting to 28 billion US dollars in January April this year, up 100.8% year on year, the State Statistics Committee reports. The share of state owned organizations in the total implemented work was 4.3%. The private sector's share comprised 95.7%. The total volume of construction works provided by large construction companies amounted to 5 billion US dollars. Small enterprises and micro firms contributed with over 15 billion US dollars. The new and only neurological center in Central Asia is soon to erect in the capital city of Uzbekistan. This was announced by the acting deputy mayor for housing and communal services and improvement, Shakro Rahim Janov, as he met with consultants of the Japanese company JICA. JICA is set to participate in the construction of new building. The new center is to provide high-quality services across the region. Uzbek politicians stressed the relevance of construction of this project. They expressed their readiness for close partnership during construction. A shooting at a pool hall outside Miami left two people dead and more than 20 injured early on Sunday. Miami-Dade Police Director Alfredo Ramirez III tweeted, quote, I am at the scene of another targeted and cowardly act of gun violence where over 20 victims were shot and two have sadly died. CNN reported a white Nissan Pathfinder pulled up to the location and three people got out with assault weapons and handguns and started firing into the crowd that was gathered for a concert at the venue. CBS 4 Miami said police had no one in custody as of early Sunday. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis said state authorities were working to catch the perpetrators. Quote, justice needs to be severe and swift, he wrote on Twitter. The Florida mass shooting is one of a number that have taken place in the past few weeks in the United States. A small plane crashed into a lake outside Nashville, and authorities late on Saturday said that after several hours of searching, all aboard were presumed dead. Joshua Sanders is the Rutherford County Fire Rescue Captain. Uh, our efforts have transitioned from a rescue effort to that of a recovery effort at this time. Uh, we have conducted dive operations since our last media briefing. Uh, we have identified several potential targets for dive operations that will resume in the morning. A local TV station reported the Cessna C501 was registered to a partnership formed by Brentwood-based Christian diet guru Gwen Shamblin Lara and her husband Joe Lara. WTFV reported their daughter sent out a text message to members of their church that several church leaders were also aboard the plane. During a speech on Sunday honoring the U.S. Holiday Memorial Day, U.S. President Joe Biden said that he will press Russian President Vladimir Putin to respect human rights when the two leaders meet in June. I'll be meeting with President Putin in a couple weeks in Geneva, making it clear that we will not, we will not stand by and let them abuse those rights. The White House said on Friday it was planning to move ahead with the summit between the two leaders after Microsoft flagged a cyber attack on U.S. government agencies. It was carried out by the group behind last year's solar winds hack that originated from Russia. But the Kremlin has said it has no information about the latest attack. The White House said the two leaders will discuss a range of issues when they meet on June 16th. Many of you know this is a hard day for us. Six years ago today, Hunter lost his dad and I lost my son. During Sunday's speech, Biden spoke at length about his son, Bo, who died of brain cancer in 2015. If he were here, he would be here as well. Paying his respects to all those, all those who gave so much for our country. He also consoled grieving families who've lost loved ones in the line of duty. The moment that we celebrate it is the toughest day of the year. We're honored, but it's a tough day. It brings back everything. And so I can't thank you enough for your continued service to the country. And your, uh, your sons, your daughters, they live on in your hearts and in their children as well. 
Earlier on Sunday, the president visited Bo's grave with Bo's son, Hunter, and was joined by the first lady along with other members of the family. Zhang Hong ascended to the peak of Mount Everest in total darkness. The Chinese mountaineer is now the first blind person in Asia and only the third in the world to do so. But even when he made it to the top of the tallest peak in the world, he says his lack of sight kept him from celebrating too much. When I got to the top, the sound of the wind was extremely scary. It was like a howl, so I was very scared. After reaching the peak, I didn't feel exhilarated or emotional like other climbers. I did not think too much as I thought that the environment around me was quite risky, so I told my guide that I wanted to get down quickly because I knew getting to the top was only half the climb. The 46-year-old scaled the mountain from the Nepal side. He completed the almost 9,000-meter high Himalayan feat on May 24th, along with three high-altitude guides, and returned to base camp just three days later. No matter if you're disabled or normal, whether you have lost your eyesight or if you have no legs or hands, it doesn't matter. As long as you have a strong mind, you can always complete a thing that other people can't. Zhang lost his sight at the age of 21 due to glaucoma. But he says he was inspired by Eric Weinmayer, a blind American mountaineer who scaled Everest in 2001. Nepal reopened Mount Everest in April for foreigners after it was closed last year due to the global health crisis. The leader of a far-right Israeli political party on Sunday declared he would join with a centrist faction in a new unity government that could spell the end of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's 12-year grip on power. Naftali Bennett, who leads the ultranationalist Yamina party, said he was convinced that only an alliance with centrists and left-wing parties would save the nation. I am announcing today that it is my intention to work with all my strength to establish a national unity government together with my friend Yair Lapid, so that, God willing, together we can rescue the country from its tailspin and return it on its path. Centrist Yair Lapid's Yesh Atid party finished second to Netanyahu's right-wing Likud party in the latest inconclusive parliamentary elections. Lapid has worked to cobble together a potentially volatile coalition. A power-sharing deal would see Bennett and Lapid take turns as prime minister. Israel has held four elections in the past two years, none of which delivered a clear winner and left Netanyahu in office as head of a caretaker government. Bennett was seen as something of a kingmaker between Netanyahu's push for a right-wing coalition and Lapid seeking a national unity government. On Sunday, he said he made the best choice for his country. In Yamin. There is no right-wing government. Four rounds of elections and two months proved to us all that there simply is not a right-wing government to be led by Netanyahu. It's either a fifth election or a unity government. Netanyahu responded on television calling the proposed coalition a, quote, left-wing government and a danger to Israel's security and future. Hollywood actor Steven Seagal is taking on a new role, joining a pro-Kremlin party in Moscow. The U.S.-born martial artist has long been a fan of Russian President Vladimir Putin, while Putin, who granted him Russian citizenship in 2016, is a fan of martial arts. Seagal received a party membership card of an alliance named Just Russia Patriots for Truth. It was formed earlier this year when three leftist parties, all of which support Putin, merged into one. In a video released by the party, Seagal proposed a crackdown on businesses that harm the environment. We really need to set up a situation where we can investigate, uh, arrest, prosecute people criminally uh, so that there is uh, results. Without being able to arrest people, you just find them, they're probably making more money in the production of the things that are defiling the environment than they would be fine, so it's only good business for them to continue. The party controls a faction in the lower house of the Russian parliament and plans to take part in a parliamentary election in September. 
North Korea's state media on Monday slammed the termination of an agreement between the U.S. and South Korea that limited South Korea's missile range. Korea's official KCNA news agency quoted an article written by described international affairs critic Kim Myung-chol, accusing the U.S. of shameful double-dealing. The pact limited the development of South Korea's ballistic missile program to a range of 500 miles. South Korean President Moon Jae-in announced an end to that deal after his first summit with U.S. President Joe Biden earlier this month. Kim criticized Moon for welcoming the agreement's dissolution. He said, quote, The termination is a stark reminder of the U.S.'s hostile policy toward the Democratic People's Republic of Korea and its shameful double-dealing. He said Pyongyang will counter the move. So far, these have been the latest news for today. Goodbye. Take care.